remove any distractions, Lord, and let us come here and, and focus on what you have for us today. Bless this time that we have together. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may have a seat. So we're going to be partaking in communion first thing this morning. So for those of you who want to partake, you should have been given your elements at the door. So you go ahead and you peel the first little piece of plastic to get to the bread, and then you peel that second piece to get to the, to the juice. This is something that we do here on a monthly basis at Turning Point Life Center. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So we want to make sure that we don't partake in this communion in an unworthy manner. An unworthy manner would be a manner in which that you can't get right with the Lord right now in your heart as you sat here this morning. Anything other than that would be an unworthy manner. You're going to run right, you know, leave here, and it happens. You run right back to sin. Maybe you're living together. Maybe you're doing something like that that's out of the will of God. That's an unworthy matter, so we would ask that you wouldn't partake so that you don't drink judgment on yourself. So either way, if you partake because your things are all right or if you don't partake because there's things going on in your life and you respect the word of God enough and you respect the Lord enough that you're not going to partake, you're being obedient either way. So we just want to encourage you, however it applies to you, to just to be obedient. This is serious business. It goes on to say in the scripture there that they, they were drinking uh, and partaking in communion, not partaking the right way. They were bringing illnesses and sicknesses upon themselves. So it's serious business. What we're doing right now, we're remembering what Jesus Christ did for us. We're going to talk about grace today. And what a perfect day to talk about grace when we think of the cross. We think about 2,021 years ago when he crawled up on that thing and he died for us. That's what we're remembering today. We're remembering every lash today. We're remembering every drop of blood today. We're remembering every piece of beard that was plucked out of his face today. Every word, foul word that was spoken to him today. That's what we're remembering today. As he journeyed up with that cross, and it, we, we think of his life, we think the life that he lived, we think of his death, and we think of his resurrection, right? We're remembering all that today. Serious stuff. So 1 Corinthians... Let us never forget, not just on Communion Sunday. There's times in my life when I want to have a pity party and then I think about what the Lord Jesus Christ done on the cross for me. And how that cross saved my life. Because of that cross, I'm not strung out on drugs anymore. Because of that cross, I don't do things I used to do. Because of that blood that was shed on that cross. So whenever the old world wants to kick you in the gut, just remember what they did to Jesus. Give you the strength to make it through another day. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. For I received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We'd ask you to pass them to the center, and they'll be collected for you. In verse 26, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen? He'll collect your... We just want to remind those that might be tuning in online that the last Sunday of the month we partake in communion so they can always be prepared to have their elements ready and partake along with us. Amen? 
So the Christian life from the beginning to the end is totally dependent upon <clears throat> God's grace. You know, our theme for the church this year is get right with God. And because of his grace, we are able to get right with him. That's what's so cool about it. Because of God's grace, no matter what you've done, no matter what you did yesterday or the day before or last week or whatever, because of his grace, you're able to get right with him. It's up to you to come to him and get right with him, though. Amen? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, it is not from yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, for it is by grace you have been saved. God is the one who initiated this grace to us. He took initiative in providing this grace for us. He's the one that chose to send his son down from heaven to, to pour this grace out on us. He took initiative, right? He said, man, this law is not working anymore. So I'm going to have to show some grace. The new covenant was his idea. And through that covenant, we get to receive his grace. What we just partook of was the new covenant. <coughs> that was his idea. In Jeremiah 31, 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with my people of Israel and with the people of Judah. See, the days were coming. We needed a new covenant because the old covenant brought condemnation. The old covenant was, was, was temporary, but the new covenant that you just partook in is eternal. Hallelujah. Yeah, hallelujah. Amen? Amen? It's eternal. What we partook in this morning is a covenant of grace. And we come to him with a clean heart of repentance of our sin, and he pours that grace out upon us. He just pours it out. He's got a never-ending cup of grace. That never goes empty. There's nothing in your life you can do that will stop him from wanting to pour that grace out on you as long as you come to him in confession and repentance. There's nothing you can do to make Jesus, God, or the Holy Spirit love you any more at this very moment in your life. There's nothing that you can do. There's no amount of doors that you can knock on, no amount of plates that you can hand out, no amount of church services that you can go to. No amount of money that you can give in that offering. There's nothing you can do to make them love you any more. Therefore, there's nothing you can do to make them love you any less. He loves you. He may not love the things that we do, but he loves us. And that's grace, right? John 1, 16, out of his fullness, we have received grace in place of grace already given. Grace upon grace. Not only did he show us grace for salvation, right? But now he continues to pour his grace out on us. He gives us a chance every month to remember this grace, right? When we partake in this covenant, this sacrifice that he paid, uh, the price that he paid. We think about that empty tomb. We think about that amazing grace. And there's more grace to come. Grace upon grace. Like I said, the cup never runs empty. Full of grace. Hebrews 9.15, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. That those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Not that he has died as a ransom to set, now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Right? Like we said a minute ago, for it is by grace that you have been saved. Christ carrying that cross is a, Perfect picture of God's grace. He doesn't ask you to die on no cross. He's not asking you to get crucified. He's not asking you to get beaten. And he's not asking you to get nailed to the tree. He's just asking you to pick up your cross and just carry it with him. Right? Maybe die to yourself a little bit. Through faith, this is not from yourself, it is a gift. Of God, it's a precious gift, right? A lamb without spot or blemish, perfect, sinless, sacrificed was the gift. I talk about it when we, we'll do Christmas service. It's a, it's a gift that just keeps on giving. It's a gift that you get to unwrap, uh, the gift that salvation that the Lord, we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's something that you never get done opening. As the scripture even says that you work out that salvation with fear and trembling. I get to learn a little bit more and experience a little bit more of this gift of salvation every day. 
I experience a little bit more. Every time when I think I can't love anymore, the Lord will tell me, yeah, you can. Every time when someone's offended me to the point that I think I never can forgive them again, the Lord says, yeah, you can. And it's like, wow, I can. Because of his grace. Because of this gift. Man, gift that keeps on giving, right? That's why it's so important. If you want to give anyone a gift, give them the gift of salvation. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. Tell them what the cross is, what the blood means. Talk to them about communion. Share with them. How many of you have someone in their family that needs to hear about Christ that, that's going to go to hell otherwise? Quite a few of you. Sounds like you've got a lot of work to do. Because they're on your watch. God has us here for this season for a purpose. Right? Not by work so that so that no one can boast. See, there's nothing you can do on your part to earn salvation. There is nothing that you can do on your part to earn it. No amount of work, I said it earlier, no amount of giving, no amount of service. And we're going to have a, 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 a ministry fair next week, and we're going to do it different this year. Usually we do it during service. We have tables set up, and I'll preach a little bit on gifts, and then we'll stop and we'll let you walk around and you'll sign up. But we've learned uh, over the past that people just sign up over some emotional deal that, oh, we're in here and I better sign up to something because everyone's looking. You know, it puts a little extra pressure on people. So this year we're going to preach a message, and then we're going to whoever wants to serve. Because we don't want you to sign up for something you don't want to do. Because then it just doesn't work out can walk to the other side, grab a cup of coffee, and go around. And there's plenty of places. You could be a greeter. You can work in the nursery. You can, uh, if you want to get involved with men. And, I mean, there's, all, and there's nothing on there that you see and you think of something, man, say something. If you're part of this church and you want to serve and we don't have the area, but you've got a legit area you want to serve in, let's talk about it. The more the merrier. This is your church, right? And you're going to get an opportunity to serve. It, with the seasons coming up, we're going to do our Harvest Fest this year. Set up some booths and hand out some candy and play some games and get back to that what we used to do, right? Yeah. We're going to have our turkey dinner here this year. Right. County's approved us to have our dinner here this year. <laughs> we got a Christmas giveaway. We got stuff that we haven't given away from last year. All Man, right. uh, unless something changes dramatically in, 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 uh, in the county or in the valley here, we're going to do that too. We're going to get back on track, and it takes people to serve. Right. takes people who love the Lord, man, who want to do his work. Right. we got to get back on track doing that. We're going to, right, we usually put a tent up. Everybody knows where we put the tent up out there by the children's church. Well, I've uh, been looking around, and I think we're going to get just a metal, big old uh, carport thing. Wow. It's going to cost us a little bit of money. Because the tent that we share is messed up and I was going to buy another tent. It was going to be about four grand. And it just wasn't as heavy duty. We're going to put up a permanent shade out there. That's up all year round. That's like this, but it's a 39 by 30. Almost the same measurements of that tent. It'll cover that whole place. It'll be up year round. So we'll have shade and have a place, you know, of shade. And, and we could do our stuff under that. Children's church can have a place during the, during the, during the wintertime, nice weather, we got a jumper. If the children's church needs it, we can plug it in every Sunday for those kids, put it, you know, and, and, and get back to what we used to do. The Lord said, why buy something that's going to last you a little while when you can buy something that will last you? The, the, it's, it's got a metal top like this building will last you forever. Might as well invest a little bit more and buy something that will last forever, right? No amount of work, no amount of giving, no amount of service, right? It's not by works. Amen. We work because we have faith, right? Amen. Strictly by grace. It's only because he loves you that he's poured this blessing of salvation out on you. Not nothing you've done, right? Yes, if you have faith, you're going to do something. Faith without works is dead, right? You're going to do something. Faith without works is dead. If you have faith, you're going to do something. Man, if you have faith, you'll, you'll sign up. You'll be a part of something. Hey, you might never have signed up before. Sign up. Give it a season. Do it for one season. 
And when you sign up, man, you're committing to doing it for that season. And then we can all do anything for a season, right? And try it out. And see what the Lord don't do with you in that season. And if you didn't like it, you didn't enjoy it, the next time don't sign up. But don't just not do it because you've never done it. Don't know if you'll be good at it. You're created in the image of Christ. Right? He lives in you if you're a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can do all things. So if you have faith, you'll serve, right? If you have faith, you'll give. If you have faith, you'll do for the Lord. Because faith without works is dead. We all know the person that has dead faith. Right? We all have friends that have dead faith. We we don't want to be in that category. But you do it knowing that it doesn't save you. What saves you is the grace that was poured out on that cross, right? You do it out of gratitude for what Christ has done for you. And when you fail at something, you attempt to do it again and try to do it better because of his grace. Amen? See, there are times in my life I fail. I, I fail as a husband. I fail as a father. I fail as a papa. I fail as a friend. I fail as a pastor, Right? And in that failing, there are times I want to quit. Times I want to go throw my hands in the air and give up, right? And the Holy Spirit reminds me every time of God's grace, right? And it just makes me want to try a little bit harder, right? When I think about what Jesus has done for me, I couldn't quit. He didn't quit. He went all the way to the cross. So there's, there's going to be times in your walk with the Lord that you want to throw your hands in the air. It's all right. Have your little temper tantrum, get your little thing over with, and keep on trucking with the Lord. For me, I'll call Helen late and I'll have a temper tantrum. I called her the other day, had a temper tantrum on her. She had to pray for me. And I got off the phone, I felt like a weight was lifted off of me. Man, I got to keep trucking. Right? That's all you can do. Right? Look at Romans eight eleven. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. See, the Holy Spirit will remind me of that verse, right? He'll remind me of that. And and when he reminds me of that when things are tough and things are hard, then I realize that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? His spirit brought these old dead bones of mine back to life 17 years ago. His spirit came into my body and resurrected myself, man. Right? New body, new heart, new mind because of his spirit. And he wants to use them for his glory. He wants to use you for his glory in 1 Peter 4.10. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others. That's faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. See, we're stewards of God's grace. He's given us a measure of grace. I'm a steward of that grace. Man, I'm supposed to take that ball that he's handed me, and I'm supposed to run with it. Right? I'm a steward of that. What what are you doing with the grace that he's given you? What are you doing with the faith that he's given you? What are you doing with the mercy that he's poured out on you? What are you doing with that? You're a steward of it. I'm a steward of it. Right? Right? So when I want to quit, I'm not being faithful steward of God's grace, right? When I want to quit, I'm being a quitter. When you want to quit, you're being a quitter. And it says there, his his grace comes in various forms, various forms. His grace reaches us, but it should not end with us, right? It reaches us, but it doesn't end with us. See, we're supposed to be channels of whom whom through that grace can flow. Man, as as I think about all the grace he's shown me and all the mistakes I made, it's a little bit easier to show someone else some grace. It's a little bit easier to overlook overlook the gossip that you hear. Oh, well, that's just his grace. Right? All the smack that they talk, well, I got to think about his grace. Right? Makes it easier. 
But when you're out there in the world and you don't experience that grace and you handle things the way the world would handle things and you just, boom, boom, you attack and you get, you get back and you get even and blah, 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 because you don't, you don't know what grace is. Amen. I've been there in my life once before, right? Grace is the way to go. Be an instrument. Nothing better to be able to look someone in the eye and truly love them when they've talked smack about you, Amen. Right? Nothing better to love them. You got to love them. God puts these people in our life to grow us. Right? And then in those times in your life with me here lately, I, I've made a couple mistakes in my life and hurt someone's feelings tremendously that, man, I didn't intend on hurting at all. Farthest person from I would ever want to hurt. But then you have to go make those things right. And because of his grace, you can Right? I want to encourage you folks, if you've ever offended anyone, I want to encourage you to make it right. When it's, if it's ever been brought to your attention, make it right. Because then the devil, that foothold the devil may have in that situation is broken. And it's broken because of God's grace. See, because of his grace, we're not going to be perfect, but we can be forgiven. Right? Because of his grace. I haven't met a perfect Christian yet. Right? But I've met a lot of great ones. And it's because of his grace. And that grace should be extended to others. We should be a channel of his grace to others. You know, the scripture even says if you know someone has something against you, go. Go. And be an instrument of God's grace. Amen. Go reconcile, make peace. Right? That's the least we can do when we think about what he's done for us. Amen. You think about everything that I have access to because of the kingdom. How my life has changed because of the kingdom of God, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, right? Amen. And I, when I think about how that blood had to be shed, the most gruesome way possible, he had to give it up that way. Man, I can do anything. I can humble myself. I can pray. I can go. I can, I can do whatever I need to do to represent him to the best of my ability and try to learn from those things that I don't do right, right? So can you. God's grace can, compensates for human weakness. First Peter 5.10, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while. Will himself restore you, make you strong, firm, and steadfast, right? Amen. Said there in the God of all grace, our salvation is because of his grace, First Peter 1.10, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, searched intently and with the greatest care. And like I said, the new covenant was grace poured out on us. It's salvation through Jesus Christ. It's a covenant of grace, right? And for those of us who have repented, we've tasted the Lord's graciousness, right? We've tasted his goodness. In 1 Peter 2, 2, and 3, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. See, once you taste it, man, you can rely on it, right? You try that one certain seasoning and you put it on that steak and it tastes good, man, you know that's it. That's the ticket. I've tasted that the Lord is good. Some of you have tasted that the Lord is good. You taste how good his grace is and it'll help you to overcome the things in your life. You know that through his grace there is hope for change in your life because of his grace. So because of... His grace, I know the areas of my life that I need to change, I know they'll get changed because of his grace. All I got to do is put forth the effort. Whatever areas in your life that need to be changed because of his grace, you got to put forth the effort. The only thing that's preventing you from making those changes is your effort, is your spiritual disciplines, your daily disciplines. To be a better husband, be a better father, be a better friend is putting forth the effort because his grace is there, man. Everything you need is there. He loves us enough to change us and conform us into his image. So we shouldn't be afraid of anything that he purposes for our life. 
His grace will meet you in any situation. What we do wrong is when we get in a situation, instead of looking to him, we look to ourselves. And we expect ourselves to meet the need in the situation. When all I got to say is, Lord God, your grace. I don't need it. All I need to do is be an instrument of grace. All I need to do is receive your grace. And this situation will change. And everything works for the good of those who love the Lord. Sometimes we have to be reminded of how stupid we can be. Sometimes we get comfortable. But thank God for his grace. As we submit to him, he gives us grace that we need. The God of all grace, right? That's what that scripture said. He's the God of all grace. And he tells us in Hebrews 4.16. Here's where we, well, this is what we need to do. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, before the only, there was only one priest that could enter in to the room of, the, on the day of atonement. Only one priest could enter in, right? And come into his presence. But because of this grace that we partake in today, this new covenant, every believer in Christ is invited and is encouraged to come boldly to the throne of grace. I don't have to wait on a priest once a year. I can come boldly to God's throne of grace anytime I want. Doesn't matter if I'm in my car, or I'm at work, if I'm up here, if I'm sitting in the seat. It doesn't matter. I can come boldly. Boldly, he says, come boldly. Don't come afraid. Don't come ashamed. Come boldly. I got some here for you. I got a cup that's never going to run empty, a cup of grace. Come and get your fill. It's an invitation for all of us. And there's a purpose behind the invitation. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Mercy means that God does not give us what we deserve. We deserve punishment. We deserve hell. Because of his mercy, for those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we're not getting that. Right? Grace means that he gives us what we do not deserve. We don't deserve forgiveness. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve the ability to change. We don't deserve the ability not to give up. But he gives it to us anyways because of his grace. And he says, come boldly and ask for these things. Don't hesitate, he's saying here. He's saying, come now. Come quickly. Come and receive what I have for you. Some of us may be sitting here today, tuned in or tuned in later, and you're trying to do something in your own strength. You're trying to figure out in your wisdom how you're going to handle something or fix something or whatever. God just says, come to, boldly to the throne of grace. And then pouring out that grace, he'll pour out some wisdom. He'll pour out some discernment. Right? Come boldly. You don't have to come to him all. Come boldly. Lord God, I'm here for my grace. Lord God, I'm coming to get filled with grace. I'm ready to receive, Lord, what's mine. See, the world will give you whatever you'll take from it. The world will have you kicking that can down the road all the way home. Defeated. When God wants to pour his grace out on you. Remember what 1 Peter 5.10 said, And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. That's when the restoration begins, when we approach him boldly. We don't have to stay in that unrestored state of mind anymore. We can approach him boldly so that he can restore us. He, and when you do, he will restore you and he will make you strong. Period. Because it, it's all determined on him and what he's done to, uh, to, to, to apply that to your life. All you've got to do is come. Come and ask and receive. And it's yours. James 4, 6 says, but, but he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. We talked about it a minute ago, grace upon grace. 
The humble are those who approach the throne. The humble are those who cry out to God. The humble use whatever gift they've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. The proud try to do it on their own. The proud try to handle things on their own. The proud operate outside of God's will and outside of God's grace. Right? And so they're not experiencing God's grace. And when you don't experience God's grace, you can never be a vessel of it to others. You can never be an instrument of it. And when you're not in the Word and you're not in prayer, you're not experiencing God's grace. Acts 20, 32. Now I commit to you, God, and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. We know the word sanctifies us. The word sets us apart. The word is what renews our mind. The word, he was the word, became flesh, right? It's a word of grace. That's how you find out about all this. You get into the word. You can never be a vessel of God's grace if you're not in his word. Never. The Word builds you up. The Word strengthens your foundation. The Word reveals God's will to you. And it also reveals His grace to you. The Word of God is a Word of grace. Remember, grace means He gives us what we don't deserve. And His Word is a letter of everything that we don't deserve. Outside of what Jesus Christ done on the cross, right? We don't deserve anything written in that Word. But because of his grace, it's all ours. We didn't do anything to deserve it. We didn't do anything to deserve for him to go pay for our sin on the the cross. We didn't do anything to deserve anything but hell. But it's a word of grace. That's why Peter says it in 3.18. 2 Peter. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory of God. Forever, endeavor, amen. See, grace and knowledge go hand in hand. It's a word of grace, right? As you read the word, you grow in both grace and in knowledge. And the more you read the word, how you grow in grace is that you're more loving, you're more sensitive, you develop the fruit of the Spirit in your life. You can be more caring, you can be more gentle, you can be more respectful as the word gets in you and transforms your mind and renews your mind and heart. It fills you with his grace and you just become an instrument of his grace to others. And even in some of the hardest situations, you'll walk away thinking, wow, Lord, man, you did it there. How how did I say that? How did I respond that way, Lord? How did I react that way? Uh, And and it was all his grace. Because it was in you. See, we get all this word in us, right? And sometimes the Lord puts us in situations for us to walk some of this stuff out in our lives. And then you walk out that word in your life. You're more loving. You're more compassionate. You're more forgiving. Therefore, you're more graceful, right? We're supposed to pray for grace. Psalms 25, 16. Turn to me. Be gracious to me. For I am lonely and afflicted. See, David is asking God to be gracious to him. He's approaching the throne of grace. He's crying out to God. He's saying, I'm afflicted, Lord. Turn to me, I'm afflicted. Pour some of that grace out on me. Peter said it after you have suffered for a little while. He himself will restore you. He'll make you strong. He'll make you steadfast is what Peter said. David is saying, for I'm lonely and I'm afflicted. He's seeking God's grace, right? And when I get down and out, I cry out to God as well. When I make mistakes, I seek his grace. Oh, Lord, help me to do better, Lord. Help me to be better. Help me to see through your eyes, Lord. And when we fail God, he's there to restore us. His word says it right there, right? Restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Didn't say, I'll think about restoring you. Didn't say, I might restore you. Let me think. No, no, we'll restore you. You can get down on your knees broken, tore up, beat up, ready to give up, and crawl up off those knees restored, firm, and steadfast. And that's because of his grace. And in closing, an ongoing experience of God's grace 
requires our cooperation. Yeah, we experience it the moment that we experience Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But an ongoing experience of it, it, it requires our cooperation. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Think about that. As God's co-workers. You may have co-workers wherever you work. But you have one El Jefe co-worker. And his name is God. You are God's co-workers. Christ's ambassadors. Man, God's co-workers. It was Paul who had gone to Corinth with the good news of the gospel and through his ministry the church had been founded. But even then, as Paul wrote that passage, Paul was not concerned that everybody, he was concerned that everybody in the church who professed to be saved weren't truly saved. Right? And as Paul had that concern, I would imagine that there are many men who stand behind pulpits like this every week who have the same concern. You've heard me say it a hundred times. It's just not about saying some prayer. Right? So I echo today what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Test yourself. Right? Don't take God's grace for granted. Don't live any old certain way because of his grace. Oh, we are, I've heard of people say it a million times. Oh, we're in a time of grace. This is a time of grace, man. I can, I, all I got to do is go to him. His grace should motivate you to be the best that you can be. And if you're truly seeking and serving in the way that you should, his grace will motivate you to be the best that you can be. You won't trample on it. You won't take it for granted. See, you then understand it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. That's why Paul said, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Paul knew where it came from. Paul knew where the source was. Lord, turn to me. Man, just look at me. I'm lonely. I'm afflicted. Lord, give it to me. Paul didn't turn to a bottle or a bag or anything else. Lord, God, turn to me. He went straight to the source, right? Right? And one way we can receive his grace in vain is by not being an instrument of his grace to others. So often we want everyone to be graceful to us, yet, but we don't want to return that same gracefulness to others. Man, we have to, church. We have to. And if at times you struggle with that, just seek him. Right? Just approach his throne with confidence. Just be real with him in your struggle. As Paul was, I'm afflicted. Lord, I need your help. I need you to pour some of that grace out on me. I've come to him and said, Lord God, I need you right now. There's been times I stood right there. This morning I stood right there and said, Lord, I can't even preach this message. I need you. I don't even have it in me this morning, Lord. I don't even feel like it. Serious. I don't even want to be here this morning, Lord. And he shows up. And if I would stay there and stay in my pity party and, and not seek his face and seek his grace and turn to him, the Lord won't use this message for nothing. Anybody been ministered to this morning? See what I'm saying? I'll keep it real with you. Right? I ain't the only one that comes into church beat up. Right? Something good's coming. Just hang in there and ride that storm, ride that wave. Something good's coming. 
It's coming, man. Stick it out. Something good's coming for your life. He's a God of grace. He's a God of grace, right? God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. The great King David, right? Man, turned to the Lord, had nowhere else to turn. Lord, I'm afflicted. I'm wore out. I got enemies at all sides, right? Hiding in caves and doing everything else, man. I need some grace, Lord. I need some favor, right? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. All because of his wonderful grace, right? It appeared the moment of your salvation and it will grow in you as you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us never forget to approach the throne of grace with confidence to find help and mercy in our time of need, amen? Father, we come to you today. I thank you for pouring your grace out on me this morning, Lord. And I pray for each and every one here, Lord God, that we would uh, receive something from your word this morning. And we would chew on it, Lord, and we would think about it, and we'd wake up tomorrow thinking about it. And I pray that your word would cut to the heart. I pray, Lord, for each and every one of us, Lord God, that we would be an instrument of your grace. Amazing.